white text on a black background reads ableism and hip-hop crip hop artists drop knowledge and lyrics presented by the paul k longmore institute on disability hello everyone We'll be getting started shortly. Hello everyone, welcome to today's event. My name is Emily Badix and I am the Associate Director at the Longmore Institute on Disability. And uh, our work is all about studying and showcasing disability culture. And there's not a better event to do that than to highlight the artists that we're gonna highlight today and the discussion that is going to follow. So I'm really grateful to Leroy Moore for reaching out and inviting the Longmore Institute to be a partner. Next slide, please. Some quick access and Zoom tips. Our um, captioning is failing us today. So you have to use the stream text link. Uh, there's a very long link that we've, we've pasted into the chat. Um, but a much easier option is tinyurl.com backslash longmore captions. And you, you'll have to kind of uh, have that window partially open, have the Zoom window open. I know that's not ideal, but technology was not our friend this morning as we've been troubleshooting and trying to get it working for you. So we thank you for your patience. We'll also make sure to share this video after the fact with much more streamlined captions integrated, but we, we greatly apologize that you can't access through Zoom. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or have some dialogue today, respond to the artist's pieces and the conversation that's happening, please use the Q&A box, just like it's a, a chat box. We've turned off chat because it just has some access glitches. Um, so, so treat Q&A like it's just, just that. We'll also have time at the end for some, some audience Q&A. So please post your questions there. We'd love to hear from you. And lastly, this event is being filmed. With that, it is my honor to pass it over to Leroy Moore and we can stop the slideshow. And Leroy, thanks for being here today. Thanks for bringing us this event. We are so happy to share. Yes, hello, people, and thank you, Paul Longmore Institute and Emily, for having this event, for you know, hosting this event. I want to thank the um, interviewers and thank you for coming. My name is Leroy Moore, and I have salt and pepper hair, gray hair. Um, I'm an African American man. I have a a beard and a mustache. I'm wearing a white long sleeve shirt. And I'm sitting in my living room. And you can see my background. So that's me. I'm going to read the opening statement of this event. And this event is entitled Ableism in hip hop, hip hop artists drop knowledge and lyrics. So first I'm gonna read an opening statement and I introduce the artists and the, and the panelists. And we're gonna have a panel discussion first. Then we're going to do performance. And then we can open it out for questions. Okay. So, 
This is a letter to hip hop. Dear hip hop, we, Crip Hop Nation, an international collective of hip hop artists and other mu mu musicians with disabilities, am writing this letter and speaking it now to you to not only give thanks for a platform, but also to push this artistic international movement to become more critically aware and play an active, active role with us to re-educate the hip hop and music industry in our communities about not only the ableism in hip hop, but to go past the charity model of disability to step up to what Crip Hop Nation calls politically and culturally disabled with disability justice and Crip Hop politics, language, and international solidarity. This process of unlearning of ableism in the charity model of disability will take rebuilding relationships within the disability community, knowing that although hip hop from the beginning gave us a platform to not only see and express ourselves, it has become an ableist and harmful environment for not only disabled, especially physically disabled artists, but people with disabilities who want to work in hip hop, like journalism, scholars, TV hosts, and more. Musicians with disabilities have always been here. However, there has been a lack of cultural activism, especially in hip hop, with a disability justice to not only advocate, but to continue to display the talents of musicians with disabilities. And at the same time, advocate and celebrate our history, intersectional culture, and to politically ed educate ourselves, our community, locally, nationally, and internationally. For almost 13 years, Queer Pod Nation has provided public education through our music, CDs, lectures, workshops, YouTube conversations, a short video, short video clips, activism, visual arts articles, and political education locally and internationally. We have made strides. However, it has been outside of the mainstream hip hop arena. So we are pushing ourselves in 2021 and beyond to collaborate to hip hop popular arena to help to make hip hop more open and politically and culturally environment where disabled hip hop artists slash activists, journalists, scholars can not only work in, but can be proud to share and welcome others like them into hip hop. You ask how? Crip Hop Nation knows that this process has to be bigger than a one-time event. 
It must be an ongoing process with local, national, and international players, not only hip hop artists, but hip hop organizations, international partners like the United Nations and others. It can start off as a conference that will spell out goals of this ongoing re-education with materials like books, films, curriculum, and media campaigns, etc. Knowing that people with disabilities around the world are the poorest of the poor, Quipa Nation know if we want to make an impact that will change attitudes, institutional beliefs, and action, it must be well-funded and uplifted by local to international organizations and spokespersons. Are you committed to partner with Quipa Nation in pulling in resources and institutional backing to spread Quipa Nation's mission, work, and not only organize and hold, and hold this conference, but most importantly, to accomplish what comes out of this conference with Queer Pod Nation's leadership. One of the big goal is to open what we call the Queer Pop Institute and to get into the upcoming hip hop museum in New York. We have work to do and this event Speaking on ableism in hip hop, hip hop artists drop knowledge in lyrics is the beginning. I hope you will learn from my letter and from this event. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to the panel. And on the panel, we have queer pop artists like Tony Hickman, Keith Jones, DJ Quad, and we have an author and an activist from New York that's been around hip hop journalism from the beginning, I'm talking about Mr. Kevin Powell. So welcome to the panel, people, and welcome to this event. So we we have eight questions here, and you know, questions could be for anybody to jump in. The crawling, the walking, the limping, and the answer. So, for each um, panelist, please say your name before you talk, and please um, describe yourself before you talk. So, the, the the first question is, what is your connection to hip hop? And how long have you been in hip hop? So anybody can jump in. This is Keith Jones. I am the co-founder of Crip Hop Nation. You all have to excuse me. I'm trying to do a little bit um, with help, uh, but I am an African American man. I have I'm in a white room with a light on with a purple shirt, a very neutral background. Uh, to answer the question, 
I've been in hip hop since hip hop was hip hop. Uh, I started, I first heard hip hop in 1974, five, uh, and I wrote my first lyric in Brooklyn three years later in 77, 1978. Uh, my connection to hip hop goes through every iteration, um, but at each stage, we were close to being signed and ran into what we were talking about today, which is ableism. Uh, we were good enough to get there, but we were good enough to stay. Um, so that's my connection to hip hop. Thank you. How about Tony Higley? You, you wanna go next? Same question. Uh, yes, no problem. Uh, I am an African American female. I have long dreadlocks and a white background with different logos, including mine in the background. Um, yeah, my connection with hip hop ever since I was young, uh, I have been a fan of, you know, LL Cool J, all of that. And I was actually signed to a major record label and been featured on gold and platinum albums. However, when I had my second brain aneurysm and first stroke, that was when I saw the harsh reality of, of the conception or the, the concept that perfection is uh, an illusion compared to skills and what people really search for. And so my connection to hip hop is definitely, I'm a, a hip hop child, but I also am an activist in a way because uh, I don't like how it is going right now. I don't like the concept of perfection in hip hop right now. Thank you, Tony and DJ Quad. Yo, this is DJ Quad here in my studio. You can see in the background, um, uh, Hispanic, Latin, Mexican American male wearing a white T-shirt with some lettering on it. Fresh, clean, bald head, mustache, and goatee. And. Uh, my thing with hip hop is I've been into music basically all my life. Uh, I got family members that have been a part of music. My grandfather, my aunts, uncles, cousins, and sister. So music to me has basically been in my blood since, since I was born. Got into music at a young age, playing instruments and getting older and learning a little bit more about music and just having the love and the feel for music. It just became a passion to me. And when hip hop basically came about onto the radio and mainstream, it was something that caught my interest, but music has changed a lot since then, especially hip hop. Uh, the reality of hip hop from back then to now, now it just seems more, it's like more watered down, more about the appearance and not about the music and to see people change just for money. It's, uh, to me, it's like a, it's kind of like a, a shot to, to someone who's, who has the love for music and the passion, who's trying to put out real music with a real message. And I think that's what's missing nowadays is a true meaning of a message inside our music, especially now for the youth today, because our youth is basically brainwashed through all the lyrics that have been said through all these, to the music today. But like with Crip Hop, if you want some real music, this is where you gotta come. You want some real lyrics, this is where you gotta be. You want some knowledge, this is where it is. All right, Clyde, thank you so much. And last but not least, um, Mr. Kevin Powell. Thank, thank you. Question. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to thank God first and foremost for this opportunity. Um, uh, thank you, Leroy. Thank you, Keith and Crip Hop Nation. Much respect to you all. Thank you, Emily and Longmore Institute on Disability. Uh, disabilities, uh, all you here. I'm just honored to be here as an ally uh, to this community. It's very important to me. 
Uh, I've learned a lot from people like Leroy and, and Keith and Charlie Braxton, my dear friend, hip hop journalist mm. out of Mississippi. Um, real quick, my history with hip hop, same thing as a child, uh, listening to and seeing the culture before we even gave it a name, seeing the graffiti, hearing the music, hearing people rhyming, obviously Rapper's Delight, October 1979. Uh, I, in the 80s, I was a graffiti writer. Uh, my nickname is actually Kipo, K-E-P-O-1. That was my tag coming up. It's still my cat tags, the name of my company, Kipo. Um, and I also uh, was used to B-Boy, like a lot of us did. I was also uh, someone who became what became known as a hip hop journalist in the 1990s uh, with, Quin with Quincy Jones's Vibe magazine, wrote cover stories on Snoop, uh, several cover stories on Tupac Shakur, other rappers. And also had a chance to curate, produce the first exhibit on the history of hip hop with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the Brooklyn Museum, where I live in Brooklyn. One of my 14 books is called Who Shot You with the great Native American brother, uh, photographer Ernie Panicoli, which is an illustrated history of hip hop. And even as I sit here thinking about it, I need to go back in the book now and, and, and see if we actually included this community in the book. And I, I don't think we did. And so when Leroy, you've pointed out many times where there's been this, this absence of people. And so it's something that I think about more than ever. My 15th book will be a um, biography of Tupac Shakur. And that's just, it's, it's my life. Hip hop is my life. It's literally saved my life, as many of you have said. Uh, and I'm just glad to be here to share and also to continue to learn as an ally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, thank you once again. And we're going to go to um, question number two. Before going to question number two, I want to uh, back up and say that um, this event is dedicated to the late Rob Denoy's Temple. Um, he was the co founder of Crip Hop, also was the DJ for the Sugar Hill Game for like five or six years. So this is dedicated to. Um, Rob Denoy's Temple. So the second question is, um, in this movement, in, in this moment of COVID and racial justice, how are you doing with your art and writing? So let's, let, let's start with Kevin because he, he, he's, he's, he's on the, he has his video open. So let's start with Kevin Powell. The question was, how are we doing during COVID? Can you ask? I'm sorry, yeah. The yeah, yeah, in this moment of in this moment in COVID in racial justice, how are you doing with your artwork? Oof. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I've, I've been writing. It's been a struggle at times. I've been writing my poetry, been writing my articles as a journalist, uh, trying to get through this Tupac book. Um, you know, I got hit hard financially by this whole situation, like a lot of us did. Um, definitely, it's been a challenge in having to reinvent and, and go in different directions. Um, uh, and I, I, I have been a part of many circles where we support each other. Uh, as artists, as creative people, one of the things I started doing was a free writing workshop for writers who just want to get their voices out there in the last few months. And it grew into 400 people on Facebook, uh, a Facebook group called Kevin Powell's Writing Workshop. And we actually just put out a book as well, you know, uh, about 2020. And so even without much resources, you keep pushing, you know, you know what I'm saying, Leroy, you just got to keep going because we know that our voices need to be heard. Uh, any group, any community that's been marginalized, oppressed in any way, we have a we have to keep raising our voices no matter what, even when it's difficult. What keeps me going is our ancestors never forgetting what they did, what they had to go through for for me to be here. So that's what pushes me. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Can you, can you turn off your video, Kevin? <laughs> yeah. So let, let's go on to um, Keith, same yeah. question, you know, in this moment in COVID and racial justice, how are you doing with your art, which I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this moment of COVID and racial justice, this is Keith Jones speaking. Um, the art, it's funny, it's, it's that kind of mis-existence. So you are isolated, um, and the only way to express yourself is to create. 
So the creation of the art has been prolific. Um, the expression has been prolific, but COVID is a you know, it's a gift and a curse. So as much as I've been creating and we've been putting out, we're doing all these things, the fact that, you know, the one thing that COVID has done it, with art, it, it has really crystallized that it's an exchange of energy. So yes, we can do all this Zoom stuff and we can do all these performances, but there's nothing quite like exchanging that poetry and the poetry slam in a room with the same people. Um, you know, dude, it's funny, Kendall was talking about tagging. That's what got me excited about hip hop, F-E-Z-O. Um, but now, you know, it's a, just a different space. I think it'll be, I'll be clearer about how it affects me once we come out of this COVID bubble. Um, but other than that, I think it's been a gift and a curse. I've been extremely uh, prolific and creative and blessed to have worked with some amazing people. Uh, but at the same time, it has been a challenge. It's just like Kevin said, reinventing yourself and redistributing and how do you get your word out? How do you get your music out? How do you keep your lights on in order to do the art? So, it, it's been a challenge, but you know, I can't be mad. My people from Mississippi, so we know how to make things happen. Hey, baby, Keith. And I was going to Tony Hickman, same question, you know, in this time of COVID and racial justice, how are you doing with your artwork? Um, you know, it's amazing because as an African-American female or, or being African-American or African, whatever our label, language or label is, melanin dominant, um, we have been through racial injustice for so long. It's just been televised since COVID. And so, yeah, it can spark frustration and of course COVID has shut down everything so being a people person and being able to go out and perform and speak in front of you know a lot of people has changed the dynamic I agree with a lot of what Keith said like that human interaction is it's a necessary thing and so you know, we've gone through mental changes as well. And I think that has been the thing for me. I've still been creating. Um, and I'm, you know, grateful to say I'm on Keith's project as well. Uh, but yeah, it's just been different. I'm still creating, but it has been a definite change. And I don't know how to word that because you know, we're talking through a screen and depending on Wi-Fi right now. And that's the reality of our life, you know, so. Thank yeah. you, Tony. And Clyde, last, all right, hang on, it's Clyde. Same question. Okay, DJ Quad back on here. Um, this COVID, I think uh, it's basically been like a gift and a curse. Um, because as much as it has separated so many people, it also has kind of brought people together kind of like this. Um, normally when you go out and perform at events, you're together with people that you probably see all the time. And right here with the, with the internet, we've gotten the chance to be able to see people from other areas, other locations, cities, states, and countries, bringing us closer together and even having discussions like this, being able to come to a panel, perform live, show people you know, what we got and what we've been doing with our talent. Uh, as far as the writing part for me, it's been a little bit of a up and down kind of course, but I'm also a music producer, so I've been putting some time into the studio, putting some beats together, getting my stuff together, getting ready for my next project that I got coming out, hopefully this time, sometime this year. But um, I mean, coming together, being live like we are now today, it's, it's, it's also a gift because very rarely you get chances to speak to people 
live, you know, when you're not able to see them in person. But it is hurting everybody, just like, you know, financially. And being able to go out to perform live, getting that rush like you do on stage, it's a different feeling than being here on screen. You're a little bit more comfortable in your zone than getting that, just that rush. I love that rush, being on stage just before you go up there to turn the lights off, you got the mic in your hand and that beat kicks in. I just get that adrenaline rush. It just turns me into another, another person. I call it the beast inside of me, which I like to let out on stage. And uh, I mean, I can't wait to get back to that. I got some stuff that's coming up, so I just can't wait to spread it out to the world and kick up a storm like I'm ready to do. Yeah, thank you, Claude. Yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah, I can't wait to see people live again. So we're, 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 we're gonna skip around. We're gonna um, go on with the questions. Well, you know, just raise your hand if you want to ask, if you want to answer the question. We're going to try to make this a little bit faster because we got eight, eight questions and we also have performance coming out. So the next question is, um, yeah, of course, we, we all know this answer, but I would like to hear from each of you. You know, is there ableism in hip hop? And if so, how does it play out through time, throughout time? Uh, this is Keith. I'll jump into the question. It's ableism is much like racism, much like sexism. You know it when you see it. Uh, when you explain it, people go, oh, I didn't know it. Um, but it, it manifests itself in a strange ways. So it's, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, when I was trying to get on, quote unquote, you know, you needed to have a record label. So you needed to have a demo and all of these things. Um, but if you, you know, they told me, we don't know how to market a dude with cerebral palsy in hip hop. So you dope, but, you know, if you could just keep doing all the writing and let your man do it, because man, he don't look disabled that we can sell that. So that was 20 some years ago, 30 some years ago. And we're still in a place where the predominant voices you hear in hip hop are corporate pushed, packaged, glossy, non-disabled people or non-visibly disabled people. So the ableism is deep, just like racism, just like colorism and just like sexism. Go ahead, Kevin. I think you unmute yourself. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely. You know, it, it's it's something that I didn't even think about, honestly, until I met my brother Charlie Braxton in Jackson, Mississippi in 93, 94. We had been talking on the phone for a couple of years, and, and you know, he's someone who I met who was, uh, was born with cerebral palsy as well and had been on crutches. And, you know, he talked about it, you know, but he still did his work. But it's like, you know, basically we act as if, uh, to Keith's point, that that this community doesn't exist within our communities, within America, within hip hop America, within black America, you know, within communities of color. And that's always been the case. And so, you know, and, and Keith is absolutely right. You would not see any examples of it. I think you said, uh, Leroy, you saw one example of it in one of the early hip hop films breaking of a, of a brother on crutches, but otherwise you barely ever saw, even, even saw the kept community represented. And so, you know, for me, it's been a journey of understanding. And I, I definitely would say in the last 10, 15 years, everywhere I go now, when I speak, um, I make sure that I ask about the, this community, you know, are they present? Are they gonna be present? Is there gonna be a sign language interpreter? Uh, is there going to be a, a accessibility for this community? You know, how can we make this possible? Uh, and I have felt bad when certain spaces were not accessible. And I've said, well, I need to be able to talk to this community as well. I can't just act as if they don't exist. I can't just ignore them. They have to be a part of the work. And as you know, Leroy, you know, even the film that I'm doing now on manhood, 
you know, because of the work of people like you and Keith and others, you know, that film is inclusive of all kinds of men, which certainly includes this community. But just like Keith said, just racism, sexism, it could be homophobia, transphobia, any form of oppression, you know, it's always about eliminating people, erasing people, othering people. And so absolutely hip hop. And we know that hip hop has had some horrific lyrics about the disabled community, making fun of people who are disabled through the years uh, in different ways, you know. And so we have to challenge all of it. I completely agree. And that's part of my work now. Thank you. Any, anybody else want to jump in before we go on to the next question? Yeah, I wish y'all could see me in the in the background. I'm like, yeah, 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 exactly. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just wanted to add, I definitely see the ableism and I saw it more after I became disabled. I didn't, I was the ignorant one on that side because it wasn't in my face so much, so I didn't know. But you know, just seeing it now, it's not just, you know, the disabled community. It's if you are obese, if you're really too big, if your skin is too dark, or if they're, if you're too old, everything is so many concepts surrounding that subject that, yeah, disability is definitely the top, but it's the industry just is so restricted on age and everything, and it's a big problem. So I just wanted to add that. Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, anybody want to jump in before we go on to the next question? I boy, three, two. Can I say, I, Keith? I forgot to say, I'm um, I'm Kevin Powell, um, close crop haircut, practically bald, brown turtleneck. Uh, my apartment is green. The wall behind me is green. I forgot to identify myself for folks out there, so I apologize. Thank you. No problem. So let's go on to, I'm going to jump around these questions. So, you know, how, how do we fight against, against that and at the same time continue to create? So how do we fight against ableism and hip hop and continue to create? This is Keith. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> mm. Tony. Tony, you, Tony, you go first. All right. Uh, yeah, I was going to say you create, you keep creating, you still make your voice heard. Like, look what we just did with Rise in Phoenix, you know, like that's amazing, but it's because we all have still constantly been creating and then Leroy just was the connection. So I believe if you keep committing to your craft and your purpose, your voice will be heard no matter what the situation is. You, you just have to stay committed and, you know, like I'm grateful to be a part of Crip Hop because it's a, that statement in itself is activism. And um, yeah, so that's my two cents on it. Keep creating, have that I be damn attitude. And yeah, I'm here whether you like it or not. Amen. Keith? Ditto. Ditto again. Uh, <laughs> but th that and the other part is we have to have, we have to have, uh, an expectation uh, as well as a standard. So an expectation that when we interact with people that they have some level of intelligence to recognize our humanity, that's number one. Um, and number two, that we steal ourselves in our own humanity because we know that once we walk out, whether it's to the store, whether it's trying to date, whether it's going to the club when we were open, or trying to get on TV or trying to get a record deal, that that which we cannot change about ourselves is what's gonna be used to try to other us or to separate us. So the best way to do it, I'm gonna say it again, ditto. Keep banging out your stuff. Tony is killing them. George is killing them. DJ Quad is killing them. Kevin's writing the book. We, we, we are creative, so the creative energy will not stop. But 
the industry is changing. You used to, you used to could have to go directly to the majors in order to get to the masses. Now it's almost like the inverse. So we go to the masses to get to the majors, but I can't. Tony said it all, so I'm gonna shut up right now. Yo, Keith, we we before you go, there there's a question in the chat. Uh, Nick wants us to explain um, how did Quip Hop form and how did we all meet, especially you and me, Keith. So, can you tell that story? <laughs> Okay, you're just gonna put me on the spot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, so Crip Hop um, really started with the conversation between Leroy Moore and Rob the Noise Temple, and then it spread out from Leroy finding me on MySpace. Oh God, that was 2031 BC. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we met. We exchange um, messages via um, MySpace and emails and phone calls, and we met face to face in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention. And from there, we have gone on to do um, all the work and try to build out Crip Hop because we found out that, you know, we laughed. We were like, I know there are more disabled rappers and poets and singers and dancers. I know because I know them, right? And we do the things because we do them. And to put together Crip Hop was something to say, you know, here is here we are. And people were offended with the terminology Crip Hop. Isn't that offensive? Isn't that bad? But, you know, we own who we are. We own the negativity that people are going to try to try to put on us. We own all of that, and out of that came Crip Hop, and that's what put us on the map and gave us the ability to do what we do. So I hope I told the story right. And I want to add that we met at the DNC in Boston, and almost got kicked out of the DNC. Um, because of our politics, so it's really um, interesting, you know, to come forward and see that history, that um, Quip Hop and Keith Jones and I met face to face at the DNC. So I'm going to go on to um, another question. Uh, it, what, it, this question really... Um, really um, disturbs me a lot because I don't, I don't see a lot of people connecting the dots. You know, so one of my beef is that disabled, especially black disabled musicians has always been here since the blues. So how can we make sure this history is taught in the schools, are in museums like the like the upcoming hip hop museum in New York. Because I, I go to museums, I go to you know black bookstores and I, I don't see um us in it, you know. So how 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 can we change that? May I speak? Yeah, I think that, you know, as I'm sitting here listening into this powerful conversation, which again, I thank y'all for doing and having me as a part of it, it's really important that people who uh, claim to be hip hop heads, hip hop heads for life, part of this hip hop community are challenged uh, about ableism. And that's something that I feel like you and Keith and Crip Hop Nation have done very powerfully, Leroy, you know, to the point where it is centered in my mind on a consistent basis. And so even as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm saying to myself, as I write this Tupac Shakur biography, which is also essentially a history of hip hop, I have to include this community in the book because there are examples 
of the community throughout the history of hip hop. And that needs to be said loud and clear and definitely said to the Universal Hip Hop Museum that's coming up in the, the Bronx in the, in the next couple of years in 2023, which will be the 50th anniversary, as you all know, the birth of hip hop. I feel like we just have to continue to speak very loudly about these things. And ironically, uh, Leroy and Keith, I was actually at the Democratic National Convention in 2004. That's the first time I guess we all saw Barack Obama in person or heard about him, you know. Um, but it's, it's really interesting how our histories overlap. We don't even realize it because again, we've erased this community in so many different ways. And so to hear that you all were there is very powerful to me. And that's the kind of thing that we have to do. And we got to challenge people. We got to challenge journalists. You know, we got to challenge media. Where are these stories at? Why aren't you representing? We got to challenge, challenge, challenge college campuses, high schools, the curriculum, the educational system, all of it. Because you're absolutely right. You know, spirituals, the blues, rock and roll, jazz, uh, 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 soul music. You see examples of the disabled community everywhere. But for some reason, for some reason with hip hop, you know, there's been this rigidness. And I saw a question in the, um, uh, someone's asking about Eminem using the word retarded over and over again. It's almost like hip hop, just like every other art form that we've created out of the black community was created as a response to oppression, to white supremacy, to racism, we know this. But it feels like with hip hop, you know, we've gone to some other level of not only we're using our voices to talk about what we've gone through, but many times we had dissing people in our own communities, women and girls, you know, the homophobia, the transphobia, the sexism, and then the ableism. And I feel like that that's one of the things that separates hip hop from these other music forms is that, you know, we've gone out of our way to diss people in our own community because they may be different than us, which is, should be unacceptable to all of us, given that we all have suffered from oppression in some form, you know? So I think that we gotta keep speaking loudly to it. Uh, I'm certainly gonna, I'm so glad that we're doing this film on manhood because there's no way I would do it without people like you, Leroy, Leroy, honest to God truth. And it's definitely sitting here today. I'm rethinking how I'm gonna approach parts of the Tupac book because it's the same thing. We have to put it in these spaces where people are gonna be like, oh, I never thought about this and you need to think about it, you know? And I even think the last thing I'll say as I've been sitting here, I've been racking my brain like, you know, you know, there's been issue disability, the disabled community. I mean, well, what was Bushwick Bill, you know, after uh, his, his gun injury? You know, he was disabled from the ghetto boys, but no one ever labeled it as, no one ever even identified as that. And he certainly didn't identify himself that way, but we definitely have examples in our community of folks who have been disabled, either visibly or invisibly, but they just never said it because of the shame. I think part of it is a shame that is attached to the community. And I'm gonna say it again, some of the most beautiful, powerful people that I've ever met in my life happen to also be disabled. They're still leaders, they're still dynamic, they're still powerful. That means nothing, you know, that's nothing compared to the, the, the contributions they've brought to the community, including you all with Hip Crip Hop Nation. I just need to say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, ask one more question before we get to the performance. And this question has always been in my mind since we started Quip Hop and even before Quip Hop. And Quip Hop is trying to, trying to um, be a player in this, but it's still hard. And the question is, you know, where are other disabled women in hip hop? Because I don't see it at all. I see a lot of disabled black men, but I don't see disabled women in hip hop. And of course, Quip Hop has Tony Hickman and Wheelchair Sports Camp and other people, but you know, beyond that, I just don't see it at all. And not only in, you know, artists, but in writings, you know, hip hop business never talks about disability. So, so that's the last question of today. If people want to jump in on that question. Yeah. Tony. I want to add, and I sent you someone. You did you get that link I sent you? I sent yeah. you um, a disabled hip hop rapper, and uh, I saw another one, and I've been looking for her. Uh, I think she's from like Memphis or something. But I did find another one. They're out there. They're not promoted, so it's hard to find them. But they are definitely there. They're there, and and we need to, I guess, search for them more because. 
they're definitely there. We, like you said, it's not heard. So it's even harder for them to push themselves, you know, because that stigma of not only being a, a female with a disability, but being a, a female that is hip hop, that raps, that is dope with a disability, like it's the stigma, I believe. But I'm going to help you find some people. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in to that question? Or, or anybody have, you know, other things that they want to say before we jump into the performance? I'm just recommitted and fired up by this conversation. You know, we should, it should not be acceptable for anyone to be rendered invisible. So whatever I can do to support Crip Hop Nation even more going forward. Uh, Leroy, you know, you, you asked me to be a part of this instant response because this is important to me as an ally because we, again, it, you know, we can't just be op opposed to oppression or discrimination that hate or hatred that's convenient for us. We've got to be opposed to all forms of oppression, hatred, uh, uh, ignorance, and, and that includes ableism. Thank you, Kevin. Anybody else want to jump in? No, no, oh, key. Uh, the, the funny part is, is that when we started Crip Hop and you know, you asked about women in hip hop, I always chuckled to myself because they were always there. Like women, it, like, it wasn't just us, it was us and her. Us and, you know, you couldn't be a B boy without your B girl, you know. You could, you couldn't, you couldn't rock your name belt and you, you shell to Adidas unless your girl had her, her bangle earrings and her poofy jacket. You know, you couldn't be dope if your chick wasn't rocking ass wide jeans, and if she, if you could rock, she could rock too. And so, but it, it speaks to what it, what Kevin spoke about, speaks to what the Tony spoke about, and what Quadi talked about. Those are overlapping, intersecting lines of we're not really comfortable with your humanity in terms of your gender assignment. This is a, a male dominated art form, which I grew up in it. And most of the people that I did it with, we were all, it was no division, you know? So we, we were self isolated solely because we started rocking in school and if you had a disability, they pushed you off into special education. So you had no choice but to be with only disabled people, only disabled people of all genders, all you know, gender expression types. So I never really saw the lack of females in terms of performing or doing the work. It was only on TV or only when, radio, when, when you got on radio that you started seeing that there was gonna be this delineation of gender, Who's who's really an MC, you know? Are you too disabled to do this? It was only when it became corporatized uh, and more popular. So I, I I think it's sort of a it, it was it was a then and if, but now we are at the point where there's no excuses no more. You can't you can't claim stupidity. Hip hop is fifty years old. We lived we lived through the time when they were like it ain't gonna last no more than five years. It ain't gonna last no more than 10 years. And here we are about to have an institute and they just be dominant form of music. So I think for us as artists, we are here. It's the it's the demon the it's the getting out of the music and who controls marketing and visuals to the world that we have to break that fourth barrier in order to say they don't matter if you pay and buy black Chinese disabled or not. If you funky, you got a chance to rock. Okay, thank you, thank you. And oh, uh, so I, I, I think that this is gonna be the last question. What I I think I have another quick question that I, I wanna I wanna say before we get the performance is that you know we we're all here, we're all activists, and we're all trying to push you know, for more, you know, um, artists with disabilities in, in the music industry. So if you, if you had a chance to talk to like Russell Simmons or 
other, you know, big time names in hip hop or, you know, the hip hop museum is going to open. You know, what, what would you say to them? Um, what, you know, I was thinking as we were, as Keith was talking, you know, Bell Hooks, one of my mentors has said all the time, we got to name the oppression, racism, or what some people call white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy. And I feel like that's what we've been talking about. And the result of those three things is something we call toxic manhood, toxic manhood. And the definitions of manhood that we've been given is so limited. It's like being in a box. It's like being in a prison. It doesn't leave room for, for the diversity of manhood and, ma and, and, and masculine expression, which certainly means excluding people who happen to be disabled. And it also it means excluding women who happen to be disabled and women in general, as we know, because hip hop is again, has been so male centered and male dominated for so long, just like America, just like this planet. You know, uh, hip hop is just a reflection of the larger society, the larger systems of oppression. You know, it's no different than punk rock, rock and roll, all of it, even jazz, blues, anything we can name any of it, you know, where it's been very, very male centered, testosterone driven to the detriment of people who may be different than the image that we see on a regular basis. You know, which is why it becomes easy for an Eminem to use the word quote unquote retard over and over again. You know, uh, what would I say to people like Rocky Bucano at the Universal Hip Hop Museum, who's the executive director and founder of this museum that's coming in 2023? We have to include consistent conversations with with, with hip hop, uh, the the hip hop hip hop nation, and the disabled community with the, within hip hop America. What I would I say to journalists the same thing? I mean, because I think this has, has to be consistent, it has to be loud. You know, is this space going to be accessible in every way possible? You know, will there be sign language interpreters? You know, will there be, you know, uh, 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 ramps in this space? You know, I'm assuming so, but I want to know for sure because you've raised, you all are raising very, very personal and, and political questions that need to be addressed because less, because the reality is true, y'all, hip hop was created by poor people, which you were talking about at the beginning, Leroy, and poor people who Dr. King warned us as he was organizing a poor people's campaign, not to forget, poor African-Americans, poor West Indians, poor Latinx people okay. in New York City, in the Bronx, New York, which also had a parallel energy happening on the West Coast in California with African-Americans and the Chicano, the Mexican-American community, Latinx community out there. And so how dare we, as a community that was rendered invisible, then turn around and make other people invisible? That's the question we have to push. Thank you, thank you. Tony. Okay. I gotta add real quick too. Russell Simmons, many of these people in power to get hip hop, hip -hop artists that have disabilities, Keith already knows this. Like they have already seen and made the decision that like they believe we wouldn't be accepted or that, you know, people with disabilities wouldn't be accepted. So what I say to them and everybody that has the ability to support a, a disabled artist and even furthermore look into Leroy Moore's book because then you can educate yourself on the people that have disabilities and what they are doing because Leroy Moore has a book that is created and it, it's really made to make you more aware of artists with disabilities but support every independent and disabled artists because we live on SSI. We 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 have a SSI. So yeah, Russell Simmons, anybody in charge, y'all don't want to sign or you know encourage promoting an artist, then go to their websites, go to them and find out what they're doing and spend your big money on them. Donate your 10%. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. And that, that book is called Black to see what our history 101 Tony is in it. Um the the late Cast Two. Cast Two was one of the first graffiti artists back in the 70s and he had disability. So he's in it. So yeah, Black to see what our history 101. That's the book. So let's get to some performance. I know it's three, three o'clock. But we, we have some performance and we're going to kick it off with um, Keith Jones. Keith Jones, are you ready? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm ready. I'm let me get my eyes on. I'm an old man now. Hold on. All right. See how this year I'm probably only going to do one joint just because I may have to step off for health reasons. But before I leave you, I'm going to leave you with this. Let's see if it works. And of course, technology hates me. Wait a minute. I don't think we have him. Hold on. Of course, there's no volume. All right, here we go. All right. All masked up, blue select on chill, correct tool, let's begin to be a we cheat the construct. Then self away in my state default. That black man in this plant, he this and that. Keep the cap handy. Chicks be handsy. That's a rubble combat so handsy. Focal tie cheese, they set the hit everything dead set the MR dot game changer. Auto controller of the deep soul to cast the boom back. Set the seat chart, deep speed, super feedback. Perimeter that's the chill you explain all keep that right there with you. Yeah, I'm right there with your mama. I kick your mama. So sip some big pen hits, brave beat. Can I get energy? Please get your own there. Where the hell is been at? So hell is in the synapse, causing combustible transmission. So touching is a rush in these transmission. Oh, so smooth with it, so it's easy listening. It's him, it's the F easy, so it's easy listening. Who better is it at, at the low no, to low to her say? In the north east side, wave surface, don't in any version, bounce on the any thing, this coercion. Check it when I speak that stuff, it's so good, you know you wish you heard it. Sit back and listen right like good. Yo, it's quite good. Hold on, wait a minute. Yeah, we good. I'm out. Yeah, thank you, Keith. That jazz. That's where I'm out. Thank Love you, you all. And Keith's new album is going to drop on the 26th, so check it out. Check it out. Peace, y'all. Unfortunately, my health is kicking in, so I love you. I will see you soon. Uh, All right, so going on to Tony Hickman. Tony Hickman, you're on stage. All right, y'all. Well, here we go. Sometimes you feel like letting go. Whatever you feel inside you, you can't let it divide you. You know that they're gonna try you. You can't let them define. Can't stop the gun when it clicks. Can't stop the phone when it hits. We all have a tendency to stress instead of be worry-free. And then that takes you to a place that we really don't want to be. Happens to the best of us. Even happened to me. We all feel a little pain. We all get depressed. So agitated, so aggravated, so full of stress. Just can't live in a place of darkness. Even though it hurts, we can't be heartless. Gotta give love, be love regardless. Let it go. Got so much going on. Gonna let it show. Just go ahead and let it go. They won't leave me alone. Got so much going on. Gonna let it show. That's my girl singing Cayenne. Let it go, 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 let it, let it, let what go? Stress. Yeah. 
So that was Let It Go, y'all. And the next one is uh, Make a Change. So that's coming up right now. Yeah. So y'all rock with me. I can't see y'all, but y'all can still rock with me, right? Yeah. yeah. Don't let nobody make you have a bad day. Bring you down with the words they say. It's your life. Gotta do it your way. You want to make a change, baby. Don't be afraid. So you're hating your job. Times is getting hard. Gas 3.5 when you pull out your card. It ain't credit, it's debit. Credit, forget it. It's as bad as your child when he's really upset it. It's time for a change job, ain't paying the bills. You know, know you're talented and ain't respecting your skills. He disagree with how you talk, so you tell him how you're feeling. He say, if you don't like it, you can go. Get your ass up and you can walk out the door. Find another job, man, I don't know. The economy is down, so we gonna just stay right there. Or you could start your own business, man, have no fear. Good is on your side if you done been done bad. Like Cheryl Crow, the best mistake you ever had. You're tired of helping another man drive a range. If you want to make a change, make a change. Don't let nobody make you have a bad day. Bring it down with the words they say. It's your life. Got to do it your way. You want to make a change, baby. Don't be afraid. Make a change. Make a change. If you want to make a change, make a change. Make a change. Make a change. If you want to make a change, make a change. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Hickman. So Tony Hickman, tell, tell people how can people um, find your music, find you. Yeah. Yes. So you can go to my website. You can uh, go to the store or just go through my website and you can find my books, my CDs, all of that. And it's all on Apple Music, Spotify, all of that. And once again, I am so grateful to be a part of Crip Hop. Thank you. Thank you, Tony Hickman. So last but not least, from LA streets, Mr. DJ. Well, what's up? What's up? What's up? Glad to be back. Okay, okay. So I did have some really dope music for you with some dope beats. But since I'm on a power outage right now and I'm kind of running low on my battery, I'm going to give you some a cappella of the words from one of the songs that I just wrote, especially for this event. All right, here we go. I'm a disabled hip hop artist rocking the mic. I'm not doing this for fun. I'm doing it for life. So if you're hearing me, you know I take it seriously. Don't need a fucking label cause I do it independently. I'm coming so hot, my shit be blazing. DJ Quad, I'm from the Crip Hop Nation. I say it loud, say it proud, so labels beware. I'm that crazy motherfucker busting flows from his wheelchair. I got the skills that pays the bills and make the meals, keep the crowd going crazy and give them body chills. I'm letting you all know just who I am. I'm DJ Quad, I'm the man. I wanna be the first disabled to sign to a label and bring my best shit straight to the table. So turn your chairs like the voice and listen with your ears. I guarantee you wanna sign me for 20 some years. But if not, then you must be out of your mind. That's okay, cause I'ma keep on doing mine. Stay on the grind, busting out dope beats and rhymes. It's what I do in my 24 hour times. There ain't no stopping me or labels dropping me. Crip Hop Nation's on the way to the top, you'll see. And I'll never be a gimmick or a puppet to your label. Standing strong on my feet, paralyzing disabled. And if you didn't know by now, as I told you before, I'm on the grind 724s kicking down doors. Giving everything I got, my blood, sweaty, and tears. Two decades and a half, 25 plus years. So what's that telling you? I never give up. Don't need a bitch ass label to sign my ass up. But if I did, then I'm signing to corruption. But not for me, because I'm a man of destruction. I'll blow your label up like an atomic bomb. Leave my mark like the foot of King Kong. I'm not a one hit wonder, you'll see. I got 13 more hits in the chamber constantly. Yeah. So that's, 
it's excellent. DJ Quad from LA. Um, DJ Quad and me, you know, we go back. We teamed up with a lot of quick hop um, CDs. The, I think the, the one that we like the most is the police brutality CD that we did. Uh, I think before Black Lives Matter blew up, um, we did that CD, and I think it's one of our best. You you want to talk about that CD just a little bit, Quad, before we open it up for questions? The police brutality one? Yeah. Yeah, that right there to me, uh, uh, since I'm basically a person that's been, uh, they label me as something maybe because the way I look, you know, I may look a little scary at times when I'm rolling down the street or with some friends in the car and driving next to a police car, they want to just kind of pull you over. Uh, profiling, I mean, when Leroy hit me with this project, I was like, oh yeah. It took me more than not even a half a breath to say I'm in. He didn't even have to finish his question. Um, that was uh, very personal to me because I have very close family members, friends, and good people that I know that are in the police department. And I basically told them that I'm doing something that you guys may not like, but if you are on the wrong side, you know, if you're on the wrong side of me, then you're not going to like this. But if you're someone who believes what I believe in and agree with me, you're going to you're going to understand my story. And when Leroy brought this you know, project up to me, I was like, yeah, it was a very strong message and very powerful. And even till this day, I mean, we, we did this album years ago and it's even kicking off even stronger now because like what we said in those songs and everybody that was a part of that album it's continuous. It's basically continuous, probably from many years before, from I'm talking decades ago to what it is now. And it seems like things have gotten worse. And even when things are like caught on videotape, it's like, where's justice at? Where's the justice? And I think by us having this album out and giving knowledge to people and awareness, really, because some people are telling me, oh, where'd you make that story up? It's like, story wasn't made up it's a true story and i think everybody else's songs on there are all true stories so that album right there it's i mean it's it's uh it's very it's very close to me because i can relate to it as well as probably so many other people out there can relate to it and i think that's an album that needs to be pushed out one more time again and over and over again for those who didn't has never heard it and don't hear any of those songs if you don't be sure to check that album out look it up because it's, so, it's, it's some powerful stuff quite very quick how can people get in contact with you and buy your music you can come knock on my door i'll open the door anytime <laughs> uh, you just look me up google me dj quad uh yeah or the the real dj quad on instagram you could find me uh, all over, probably all the social media, uh, the download sites, uh, uh, iTunes, uh, Rhapsody, uh, Spotify. Um, just look me up, DJ Quad Music. Uh, that's on. You can look me up on Facebook right there. Um, just look for this face. <laughs> Looks for this face. Look for my music. Look for myself. Yeah, DJ Quad Music. Look it on Facebook. Google me. You'll find me out there. Okay. Get a, get a hold of Leroy. He'll get me. He found me on MySpace. <laughs> great, great, great. And for Keith Jones, you can um, go to his Facebook page. Keith Jones has his own company called um, The Soul Toucher. And um, he's going to release his album on the 26th. And he has a press um, company that's going to Release my book called For You, Black Disabled Young Men. So look for that coming out on February 26. So we can open it for questions. Emily, can, can you help out with this? 
a part of it. Get it open up for questions. Yeah, so just a reminder, people can post their questions in the Q&A and then Leroy will be able to find them in there. Yeah, so one question is like, uh, how, how can I buy your music? Yeah, just follow each of us um, on Facebook, Twitter, and yeah, you'll, you'll find the link. Um, Keith Jones, Tony Hickman, Tony Hickman with an I, and um, myself. And also by um, Kevin Powell's books, you know, go to Kevin Powell on Facebook and check out his books. And I want to add to I'm on on social media. I'm the real Tony Hickman. Oh yeah, I'm a couple of Tony Hickmans, but you know, just remember the real, not the fake. The real Tony Hickman. Mm -hmm. right, okay. Any other questions? I I don't see um questions in the chat so far, but um. Anybody have questions, please type them in. Okay. Um, I don't see any, anything yet, but I can talk <laughs> until somebody asks a question. So um, I talked about the Crip Hop Institute. That's one of the biggest things that we're doing in Crip Hop. We want to buy a building and have a Crip Hop Institute. And you say, why do you work? Um, because Crip Hop is growing. Crip Hop is international. We have chapters all over the world. And as you can see, my little apartment doesn't fit Crip Hop anymore. <laughs> We have visual arts. We have like 10 to 12 pieces from Brazil, um, Uganda, all over the US. So we want to have um, a, a visual um, art gallery in the Crip Hop Institute. Of course, a studio. Um, we want um, a, a library because um, I've been collecting you know, black and brown, disabled artists, poets, books, music since I was a kid. So we want a library and we want an international room where we have all computer screens so we could um, reach out to crip pop artists all over the world and do events like this and more. So so the Crip Hop Institute, we're looking for a building, hopefully in Berkeley. So if anybody knows, you know, a building or a wealthy person that can buy a building for us, you know, to do um, the Crip Hop Institute, let us know. So that's one of the biggest things that we have on our plans for this year and next year. We have another question that came in, Leroy. Um, it's aimed specifically for you, but I bet we'd love to hear everybody answer. Just who inspires you musically? Anybody want to answer it? I, I, I talk too much. Tony, you unmute yourself. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I I grew up loving uh MC Light. Yeah. Uh and even now I'm a big fan of like Lauren Hill, Erica Badu, uh, I don't know, like soul, neo soul type music, but even hip hop. I would say like Lauren Hill is my number one in Rhapsody is really dope. Yeah. He's another artist that I think should really have more, yeah. you know, 
more light on her, but yeah, she's really dope too. But like, if I could do a song with Rhapsody and Lauren Hill, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, that that's what I would say. Yeah. Anybody else want to answer that question? Sure, I'll jump in on that. Uh, as far as inspiration of music, it's it's pretty wide for me because I've listened to all kinds of different music since I was a kid, um, from just your old school R&B, soul, oldies, uh, classical music. To me, music is it's a um, it, it's my inspiration comes from a vibe that I get, just the feeling. Maybe like the like people say, like the you get the vibration. Sometimes you're just your body just feels something. Um, you know, I mean, as an artist or as a producer, um, I've always been like a big fan. You know, I've looked up to Dr. Dre just because you know the stuff that he's done um, and where he came from. And, you know, plus, you know, who, who doesn't like that funky stuff that he does? You know, he does some really nice music. Um, and as far as like lyrics wise, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. There's, there's so many artists out there, you know, that have always had a lot of really nice lyrics out there. But as far as like, even too, like, maybe no one knows, but like, I've been inspired by like my family members who, who are being the music, you know, my, my aunts and my grandfather, and cousins and stuff that sang, you know, I was the only one that kind of stepped out the box and I took music to another level because I got I used to get like my aunt's old uh, albums or old Spanish stuff and sample it. And she used to be like, what the heck are you doing? You're like, what is this? You know, like, like, no, this is this is new stuff. I'm making your music into hip hop, you know, like trying to bring her back, you know, trying to tell her, but like, to me, like inspiration, the music is is my surroundings, you know, even by, around people and just like things that I've hear. Uh, I even get inspired by the whack music that's that's played now, because to me, I like it inspires me to want to just smash on them, you know, to show them like what real music is about. Because all this music that you got, you know, played on the radio, uh, I mean, it inspires me to be better than that. You know, not to not to contribute to what they're doing because that's what a lot of people are doing. Like a lot of these rappers nowadays, a lot of these young cats, they want to be what's already out there, like on the radio. And I'm like, nah, I wish I'd tell them, be who you are, be yourself, be something new, be something different. Inspire to inspire, you know, to be so to inspire yourself to have someone and be inspired by you. And that's what I try to do myself. You know, I'm not saying I'm the best at anything, but I get a lot of compliments on what I do and just the knowledge that I have that I've spread from what I've been taught and what I've learned. All right. Anybody else want to jump in before we go to another question? It's 325 now. Kevin? No, I'm good. Um, yeah. DJ Quad said it powerfully. Everybody said it powerfully. Thank y'all. Okay, so I'm not seeing the questions now. So uh, one question is, do you know any hip hop artists from Canada? Um, I know one person from Canada, I forget his name. He's, he, he, he's Muslim and he's um, uh, blind and he, he's kick ass, I wish. I wish I remember his name, but um, yeah, he, he's in Toronto. So, um, another question is, do you find that your audience have grown or changed since COVID? Anybody wanna jump in with that question? Once again, do you find that your audience has grown or changed since COVID? I'll jump into that. Um, as far as the audience goes, it hasn't really grown. It's changed a little bit, but it's changed to where people now they like they want to see you live. Even doing like I got I got friends and I got you know basically I guess called fans and followers um 
I don't like to call them fans. I like to call them supporters. Um, like people who support me and my music, they're always like, you know, like, let's see you in the studio. Let's see you bust some stuff. Like we miss you being on stage. And, you know, like, I want to go to your shows again, but when are you going to have another show? And this was like a perfect example for me to say, well, here, you want to see this? We got something going on. It's, you know, it's going to be a whole different thing than a live performance, but you'll learn a lot of stuff. So, I mean, I think like, they're still there. They're just waiting to like get out of the cage. Like all of us, you know, everybody wants to go back. Everybody wants to get back to like seeing somebody live and in person, you know, and I think that's, what's missing. I think like once we all kind of get back to that, it's going to feel really good. You know, I think it, it's like anticipation. It's like Christmas time. Like you want to know what you got for Christmas. You want to know what's another tree, you know, so you can't wait to get up, wake, wake up and go open that present. Uh, I think this is going to, it's like, it's like, we're like Christmas. We, we can't wait to, to get, be able to get out and to go see what's, you know, what's, what's out there as far as music wise. Thank you. Um, another question I see is what are the barriers in production tools of music creation that exclude the disabled from, from the get go? So, you, DJ Clark, you do a lot of production. <laughs> I know Keith, uh, the Keith is not, not here, but um, you do a lot of production. And I think Tony does some. So, um, you, you have any answers to that question? Uh, yeah, I want to add to that too. And just, I wish Keith was here right now because I always brag on him, like making beats with his feet. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the, the reality is you learn to adjust to whatever is out there as an artist with whatever you can, you know, just like I had to learn to tie my shoe with one hand, you know, like you just learn to adjust. So I think, I think as far as creating music, you just, we, we work with what we have. I don't, I don't, I haven't experienced any uh, setbacks, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Quiet. Yeah. I mean, that's actually pretty good because a lot of people always ask me questions when they see just my, my ability or lack of ability to do things with my hands um of as far as like you know being able to move my hands like everybody else normal um they always say how do you play how do you play your stuff how do you play instruments how do you play the piano and i was like i just figured it out whether i gotta tap it with my nose or my fingers or a pen or a pencil and i do it one key at a time like you do all that one key at a time like yeah i mean i basically i call myself a chameleon because i adapt to my environment I adapt to whatever it is. Just like, you know, like Tony said, like learning how to tie your shoe. You know what I mean? So I learned how to play music. I learned how to do things. I learned how to play the instruments and even holding the microphone a certain way, you know, not like normal, like everybody else. And, or I, or I got a headset, you know, I had a, you know, cordless headset. So I learned how to do things just that for me, because people try to show me ways on how they do it. But I'm like, that's easy for you, but it's not for me. So I just figure things out my own way, put more time into it. And I just create how I create and how it comes out. And I think so far it's coming out fire. Yeah, it is. Yo, Tony, you know, tell me what, what would you, what would you give advice to Dr. Dre? If Dr. Dre just had a brain, you know, and just like you did twice. So if you had a chance to talk to Dr. Dre, what would you say to him as he's recovering from this? I would definitely say uh, it, it gets dark before you start to see that you have the power in you to recover. And so don't give up on yourself. And that's the same for boss because boss just had a massive stroke. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the same for her, like regardless of everything you're going through, um, stay strong and even in your weakest points, just 
remember that everything you're going through is temporary. And so you have to fight and be strong. And again, keep that I'll be damned attitude and, and work on being your best version of yourself, but don't give up on yourself. You know, Kevin Powell, you know, you, you're about to put out this movie about black men. And I, I, I um, put on Facebook about how black uh, men in hip hop are becoming more and more disabled, but they're dying sooner compared to other artists. That's, that's what I've seen. You know, so what, what, you know, what is your, um, your, your idea or your vision, you know, um, from, from the statement that I just said in, you know, your book and your movie? Well, you know, I think for me, we can't talk about Black men without talking about this community as well. And this, this film, you know, we did a deep dive, Leroy and everyone. We, we went and looked and saw it, said, okay, has there been films done on Black men? Absolutely, you know, films like Boys in the, Men, Boys in the Hood, um, 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 Antoine Fisher, you know, Nothing But a Man. Have there been documentary films done on, on Black males? Absolutely. But what's been missing is a, an inclusive documentary film on Black males that includes this community and, and the stories that you all represent as well. Uh, because part of it for me is like, how do we give people hope? How do we empower people? Like I see one question that Emily posted, what advice do you give to young disabled artists about the music industry? You know, I think about Ray Charles and the Ray Charles movie, there's, this, you know, how he made it a point to become the best musician, the best artist possible, which is what I feel DJ Quad and Tony Hickman are both saying. I know that Keith and you feel the same way. And he also made it a point to learn the business of the industry. Remember there's that powerful moment in the Ray Charles movie where he says, well, I want what, what, what Frank Sinatra had. I want to own my masters. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. he got to that point in spite, of, in spite of the disability of not being able to physically see. And so anything that I do, and I know it's the same for you, Leroy, is about how do we empower people? How do we help people to see the genius that's already in them, no matter who they are, no matter what their ability or disability is, you know, because everyone's a genius, no matter who they are, everyone is a genius. Everyone's powerful. We just have to help people to see that and help illuminate that. And that's what my work is for this film. And I'm really excited about it because of you and other folks like you who are in the film. Um, I wouldn't do it any other way, you know? Uh, and that, honestly, part of it is because of the consistent message and the work that you all at Crip Nation have done, which is why I reached out to you in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, how, how, how are we doing on time, Emily? Well, we have time and we have a few more questions, so feel free right. to use it up. <laughs> All right, thank you, Emily. So there's one question here um, asking, has Crip Hop ever think about becoming a record label? Uh, me and Keith, we were totally against, um, you know, turning Crip Hop into a record label. Um, we wanted to do the education and the and the, um, the advocacy, and you know, and you know, Keith Jones has his own company, and most of his albums come out from his company. So, you know, my book is coming out on his um, press, his new press which I'm totally excited about because I've been dying to get a book published by a, a, a black press. But um, a lot of black presses don't, don't see um, disability as a selling issue. So I'm, I'm glad that um, Keith Jones um, is gonna put out that book coming out and on, on, on the, 26. So I'm looking for more questions. So here's one question. Are there any special or additional concerns for artists with disabilities? 
Anybody want to take that? Yeah, Tony? Um, that's a broad statement, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, because um, I don't even think it's just even with quote unquote disabilities, it's people in general. So yeah. I don't know how that would be worded properly. I, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah, yeah. You need to answer that. <laughs> I think I think the concerns are you know is what we've been talking about all day today. Right. You know, making that making sure that things are accessible not only in the mainstream but outside the mainstream. Mm. You know, so that that affects all artists. You know, making sure that artists have a voice. You know, so yeah. So, I have a question, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm using my moderator powers to have video and ask it live. Mm. Um, when so much of uh, socially conscious hip hop is often about expressing like the trauma of oppression, I guess I'm wondering, like, what sort of hip hop artists do you see doing crip hop, but maybe would never think of it that way, and have you had any conversations kind of trying to push folks into the like, this is a disability conversation that maybe think of it as a conversation about like trauma, but but don't go there? Mm. I, mm, in hip hop, you know, the, the, the one major hip hop group that, that supported hip hop since the beginning because of Rod the Noise Temple was a Sea Hill gang. And it, it, it makes sense, you know, um, the Sea Hill gang, you know, is getting out there in age. <laughs> and um, I think one, Wonder Mike are um, one of the members, you know, is losing our loss in their eyesight. So, you know, because of that and because of Rob Denoy's Temple's teaching about hip hop, the scale gang has been a strong supporter of, of hip hop. Um, MF Grimm is one of the first artists that I interviewed, and he has a disability, but he's also in the um, mainstream kind of um, environment, and he has really supported, you know, quip hop. But um, the, the thing that I see in hip hop is that mental health is talked about a lot, but we don't move um, further into disability. You know, we don't move into, you know, physically disabled, you know, artists are, Artists that have autism, artists that have that are blind. So that that push needs to happen. And I think um hip hop, you know, can do that if, if we have a, ma a major a major um platform to be included into into these discussions because I see the discussions happening on YouTube when they talk about mental health, but um, they just don't go deeper. Um, Kevin? It, 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 it's interesting. It's interesting listening because you're right. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the image of Tupac in a wheelchair when he was shot the first time, five <laughs> times, and how he could have permanently been disabled, but there's no one who's ever made those kind of connections, or even how Drake as we know, he was a young actor first out of Canada and he played a character in a wheelchair, but you've never heard Drake talk about disability, you know, the disability community. And so I think that we have to uh, do what y'all are doing at Crip, Na Crip Op Nation, which is connect the dots for people. 
Um, and again, just keep pushing these conversations because it seems like um, it's right there, but it's it's you know it's going to take the right people working with Crip Nation uh, to, to to move the needle. Because I mean, as we know, movement means mass energy of people. Mass energy of people is what a movement is, and this is certainly a movement. And we just got to keep getting more and more folks involved in this movement that are going to be willing to move the envelope. And I don't think it's going to be the some of the old school. Uh, uh, entrepreneur CEOs of labels that we're talking about. I think it's going to be the new wave of people that are going to work with us that you all will help to educate. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a statement um, from Kevin Williams and he talks about you know, different people that have disabilities in hip-hop mainstream like TLC um you know, um, other people, you know, that sick of cell. Um, and the, the thing for, um, for Crip Hop is that, yes, there's a lot of hip hop artists that have disabilities, but also they don't come out as a person with a disability because they don't see disability as a political, historical, cultural um, identity. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the education part that hip hop can provide because that's missing in, in hip hop. Hip hop sees this way as a, a, a charity or something to overcome. Those are the two options in hip hop. I mean, especially with, you know, physical disabilities, not mental health. So that, that kind of education needs to happen through, you know, hip hop or through other um, disabled hip hop artists that has a disability justice lens, that has a political education lens. I, 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 I always say that there's, there's two types of artists. There's an artist that's artist, and there's a political activist artist that that gets the history, that gets the politics. I think that's why me and DJ Quad work so good together because he he sees the whole the whole picture. So it's 3.43, I don't see any, uh, I see, I see, I see a question from a friend of mine, Steve Brown, and he says, you have talked a lot about ableism in hip hop key. What about hip hop intersection with other, with others in the disability rights movement? So that, that question, I think, um, because I and Patty Byrne um, introduced what's called disability justice. Um, and, that, and that could be a whole other panel. But um, we started that because um, we didn't see, you know, people of color, you know, in, in this way rights movement. So, you know, this way justice is for people of color, people that are transgender, people that are queer, people that, you know, haven't seen themselves in the this way rights movement. But you know, the disability rights movement has all people of um of of you know people of color that that have played a major role, like Brad Lomax and other people. So in in disability rights movement and disability rights community, of course, has you know disability culture. This way, arts. So I think hip hop 
is, you know, continuing what, you know, disability rights and disability culture has provided. And that, that's the thing that, that gets me is that the disability rights movement in hip hop both, you know, had a really impact in the 70s, but both never crossed path. And that's really interesting. I think people should start writing about that, you know, the 70s, you know, in disability in hip hop and, you know, draw the line between the two. Uh, I just wanted to answer because I read the notes in the question and answer and uh, the question that asked about disabilities in general, they were also saying like how we get paid, how people, do, do you think that people with disabilities uh, may need special help with getting paid? And that's a whole nother subject in in hip hop, because a lot of people, if they are visually impaired or different things like that, they might not know the exact measure of how to go through, like, you know, dealing with ASCAP or, you know, the publishing companies and things like that. So, yeah, that's something to be uh, added and added to the education process of what Crip Hop is doing. Thank, thank you, Tony. Um, how, 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 are we, how are we doing, Emily? Um, it seems like a good moment to start wrapping up and let yeah. people take all these thoughts with them as they continue their Saturdays. Okay. Well, you know, we like to thank, you know, first of all, Paul Longmore Institute for hosting this, um, panel and performance, you know, um, like to thank all the artists, Keith Jones, Tony Hickman, DJ Quad, like to really thank, you know, Kevin Powell for always being an ally to the disabled community. And I like to just put it out there to hip hop. Now it's on your plate. We did our part and we will continue to do our part. But now it's on your plate to open up and let's have more conversations and more um, more improvement in hip hop. Not only in the US, but internationally. So once again, thank you once again Crip out and um, thank you for the audience who came and have a good day. White text on a black background reads, thank you for watching. Please visit us on Facebook at SFSU Disability or on Twitter at Longmore Inst or on the web at longmoreinstitute.sfsu.edu.